Today we have the honor, and I have the particular honor, of presenting to you uh, Dr. Roger Hartle. Dr. Roger Hartle is a distinguished neurosurgeon from Whale Cornell Medical Center. He is professor of neurological surgery, the director of spinal surgery, and the, of the Center for Comprehensive Spine Care. He has been at the forefront and a pioneer in MIS approaches and treatment of MIS pathologies to the spine. Uh, I welcome you today. He is going to have a talk uh, about the five principles of spinal MIS, target, technology, technique, training, and testing the boundaries. Uh, Roger, I hand it to you. Thank you so much. My name is Roger Hartle. I'm a neurosurgeon in New York. Uh, thank you so much for the kind invitation and for the kind introduction. I will talk to you today about the five principles in minimal invasive spine surgery. I want to thank Dr. Riveros and the organizers for having me, of course. I know you've had a very busy program today. There were a lot of talks about different neurosurgical subjects not related to spine. So I, I think it's really uh, an honor and it's exciting that uh, I can follow up on that today and uh, introduce you into the spinal portion of this seminar and finish up the day for you today with, I think, a very interesting topic within spinal surgery. These are my disclosures. So we'll talk about minimum invasive spinal surgery and, and what is MIS spine. Now we uh, worked with AO spine on a definition and I will talk about that a little bit later. We tried to come up with a curriculum on how to teach the basics and also the more advanced aspects of minimal invasive spinal surgery. And one of the first things that we tried to do was we tried to come up with a viable definition because it's always good, of, of course, to know what you're dealing with uh, when, you, when, you, uh, when you get started and, and even as you kind of move along. So we think that minimal invasive spinal surgery is a suite of technology dependent techniques and procedures that reduces local operative tissue damage and systemic surgical stress, enabling earlier return to function, striving for better outcomes than traditional open techniques. So a few things to consider. So it's technology dependent, uh, there's surgical technique involved, and most importantly, you wanna have the same or even better outcomes than with traditional uh, surgery. So these are pretty, uh, uh, you know, difficult goals to achieve. Uh, and I will try to show you that we can achieve those goals. And it all depends on patient selection, proper surgical technique, and intelligent use of the things that we learn uh, on our journey uh, to become an MIS spine surgeon. Now, what we did when we put together the curriculum, we split it up in different uh, areas. And uh, those areas, we refer to them as the five T's. And I'll, I'll go through every T uh, with you because we think it makes it a little bit easier to kind of uh, address minimal invasive spinal surgery if you look at different sections that you can teach and train. Target, in my opinion, is probably the most important T. That, uh, that uh, refers to patient selection, so the right operation for the right patient. Tools and technology is what we usually are exposed to at meetings when we go to traditional cadaver courses or at congresses, conferences. We, we visit the, the booth, the company booth. You see the cages, the pedicle screws, the navigation systems, all, all those really interesting things that we're very familiar with. But at the end of the day, it's really all about techniques. It, it's, on, it's about how you use those. Uh, and that's what I wanna focus on in this presentation. So if you, if you get into minimum invasive spinal surgery, you'll realize that there are really three basic surgical principles and techniques that, that we use over and over again. And if you're comfortable with those, you'll become a really good MIS surgeon. The first principle is that you can do, you, you can achieve a bilateral decompression in the lumbar, thoracic, and also in the cervical spine with a unilateral over the top approach. By doing that, you preserve stability of the spine. So you avoid creating iatrogenic instability that translates then into less fusion surgery. So you can do a lot of your 
you can achieve a lot of your surgical goals without having to do a fusion in these patients. And that means that patients are gonna love you because no patients don't like fusion surgery. You're gonna have less complications. You're gonna utilize less resources, especially in these COVID times, resource, resources are limited. So if you can achieve the goal of the operation without having to do a fusion, that puts you at an advantage. And finally, indirect decompression. That refers obviously to inserting cages and we do that in order to get uh, indirect decompression of the foramen of central stenosis, but also for uh, deformity correction. Finally, we'll talk a little bit about teaching and training. I'm not gonna talk a lot about research today. Where is the role of non-invasive spinal surgery? Now, if you, if you draw a line and you plot on, on, on the x-axis complexity, and that starts from a simple pathology such, like, such as disc herniation, and you go to complex deformity, which is a very complex, the, the, the treatment of complex deformity obviously is very difficult technically. And if you plot that curve against invasiveness, so uh, the, the time for surgery, the infection risk, uh, the blood loss and so forth, you'll see that with open traditional surgery, that curve goes up pretty quickly. But you'll, you'll also see that you know, a simple pathology such as a lumbar disc herniation, if you treat that with open surgery or with minimal invasive surgery, it's not gonna be that invasive regardless. What MIS surgery does for us, it dampens the curve. Uh, and I think it does that, especially in that mid zone of spinal surgery. And the mid zone, I would define as pathologies that range from lumbar spinal stenosis, one, two, three levels, to pathologies that require a one or two or three or four level fusion. And obviously then the, the workhorse procedures in MIS surgery here are endoscopic tubular decompression for stenosis, MIS TILA for one level fusion, and then a variation or a combination of lateral approaches. So LIF, XLIF, OLIF, whatever you, you wanna use, uh, plus minus TLIF. And I think the benefit zone, the area, the, the area where minimum invasive spinal surgery really provides the greatest benefit is that mid zone of pathologies between lumbar spinal stenosis to a three, four, five level fusion. When you come to complex deformities, MIS today is just not working that well. I mean, I'm sure in 10, 15 years we'll get there, but right now MIS is not, the sweet spot for MIS is not complex deformity surgery. Um, uh, simple pathologies of, of course can and should be treated with MIS, but that in my opinion is more an area where you get comfortable using it, you get comfortable using the tubes, the endoscope, and that prepares you then to advance your surgical strategies into the, uh, the more complex procedures. Now, it is very important to realize that even though not everything can be treated with MIS, if you really add up the procedures and the pathologies, you'll realize that about three quarters of all spine surgery nowadays can be done partially or completely with minimal invasive spinal surgery. And I think that's really exciting. And as we, as we advance, I'm sure that percentage is gonna go up. It's gonna be 80, 85, 90% in a few years. I wanna say a few words about target, which is surgical decision-making. We could spend a whole course, a whole seminar on surgical decision-making and spinal surgery. Uh, I, I just wanna show you this slide and, and, and walk you through the slide because I think it's really important. Now, remember that the least invasive operation the most minimal invasive operation is the one that you don't do because the patient doesn't need it, okay? And, uh, and, and, and there are certain uh, surgeries that we see all the time. We look at it afterwards, we wonder, well, what the hell, why was this done in the first place? That patient probably would have benefited from an injection physical therapy. Keep that in mind. But when it gets to the point where somebody needs surgery, the success of MIS surgery relies on an accurate diagnosis. So you have to figure out in these patients exactly, mostly it's pain or weakness. You've got to figure out exactly where is the weakness and the pain coming from. In somebody who has multi-level spinal abnormalities in the lumbar spine, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find that one level where the symptoms are really coming from. And we try to hopefully ignore the levels that may look bad on an MRI scan, but which are not responsible for the patient's symptoms. 
So the accurate diagnosis is really important. So you got to take the history, you got to examine the patient, and that's where the spine center and the multidisciplinary spine approach becomes so important because you may want to work with a neurologist who helps you with uh, the diagnostic uh, 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 with EMG, electrophysiology, for example. You may want to get some targeted injections so you can figure out is that pain really coming from that L4 nerve root or from the L5 nerve root? So accurate diagnosis is very important. The second thing you have to keep in mind is the natural history of the disease. If somebody has a grade two spondylolisthesis with pars defect, the natural history for that is very bad. There's a very, very high chance that that's gonna get worse. So in those cases, you know that you have to do a fusion. But if somebody has a collapsed disc space with grade one spondylolisthesis with no mechanical back pain, the natural history for that is actually very benign. Those patients frequently will not progress. So in those patients, you may be able to just do decompression without a fusion. And then finally, you got to take into consideration the impact of your operation on the disease entity. Again, in somebody with a grade one spondylolisthesis, if you do a big open laminectomy, you may destabilize that pathology and that patient then you have to fuse, but it's not because of the grade one spondy, it's because of the open operation that you did. If you do this, however, through the endoscope or through the tube, you will preserve the stability and you don't have to do a fusion. So if you look at this, just an example. So if you put all this together, you'll realize you know, how complex the decision-making pro uh, uh, process can really be. But I think it's very important. Uh, this is a, a patient who came from, from Europe to see us in New York, and she came with neurogenic claudication, okay? And, and her symptoms had not changed after this operation that she had done about a year previously. If you look at this patient and the skin incision, it's the most beautifully done spinal fusion I've seen. Tiny little incisions, nice fusion. They put bone cement in there for some reason. I don't know why, but the patient didn't get better. She had exactly the same symptoms that she had before surgery. And we got an MRI scan and see she had lumbar spinal stenosis. So all she needed was actually a decompression without a fusion. And that's what we did. We did a tubular two, two level decompression and she did really well. So this just goes to tell you, you can be an excellent MIS technical spine surgeon, but if you pick, uh, pick the wrong operation for the wrong pathology, uh, you're not gonna be successful. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to lead you on the path to success and um, hopefully, uh, hopefully you, understand, you get my point. Now we're talking about the second T, which is tools and technology. Uh, so that's the microscope, navigation, the paracle screws, expandable cages. Those are all great, great things. Uh, and and uh, you've got to be able, obviously, to, to, uh, to, to use those. No lasers, for the most part. Let's talk about surgical techniques. And I think this is really where, where it gets uh, interesting. So the three basic techniques for MIS are uh, contralateral, so unilateral approach for bilateral decompression. By doing that, you minimize iatrogenic instability, interbody cage fusion in order to get indirect decompression and achieve deformity correction. Those are the three principles that we use all the time in one form or the other. Let's talk about contralateral decompression and how you minimize instability in patients with lumbar issues. Now, the idea, the idea of performing a unilateral approach for bilateral decompression is not, is not a new idea. This was done in the 1990s in Europe, uh, in Italy, in Germany was described, and then in North America by McCullough, who was an orthopedic surgeon, and Paul Young, who is a neurosurgeon in St. Louis. They brought out a wonderful book in the 1990s describing, and they did that with open surgery though. They did open approaches, but they described the unilateral approach for bilateral decompression. Here you can go over the top, you can look into the lateral recess contralateral, you get a foraminotomy there. So that was done with open surgery even. It was only then until uh, around the same time when Kevin Foley, Rick Fessler, and many others then started using tubular retractors that surgeons adopted the idea, the concept of doing a unilateral approach for bilateral decompression. Then they used the, the tubes in order to achieve that and they were able to minimize the access. And that's when it really became uh, minimal invasive. And now obviously we can do the same thing with the endoscope, which is even less invasive, but takes a long time. So the first uh, author that I know of who described tubular 
decompression for lumbar stenosis is Sylvain Palmer in this publication from 2002. And then uh, when I trained and I came back to New York, I systematically started using that. And, and in my practice, it became so obvious that this was such a great operation with low morbidity, low blood loss, low infection rate, so much better than an open laminectomy that I started using that more and more. And then I expanded using it to patients who had spondylolisthesis. The, the, the classical teaching was always patients, as, as soon as you see on the x-rays or, or on the MRI scan spondylolisthesis, you have to do a fusion. That was the classic teaching. And even until the early uh, 2000s, there were guidelines, even in the neurosurgical literature, there were public literature published recommending fusion as soon as you had to do a decompression for lumbar spinal stenosis and spondy. And why did they recommend that? Because uh, surgeons used open surgery and they destabilized the facet joints frequently and those patients then needed a fusion. But the question then is if you have a different surgical technique such as tubular decompression, does that still hold true? Do you still have to do a fusion? And I think it does not because we're going back to our surgical decision-making uh, slide. Uh, it's still the same diagnosis. The natural history is still the same, but the surgery now is different. Instead of doing an open laminectomy where we remove part of the facet joints, now we're using a tube, we're undercutting, we're leaving all the ligaments intact. So we're causing less iatrogenic instability. And therefore in those patients who have a benign natural history uh, in spondylolisthesis and benign natural history, I mean, they're gonna. They're not gonna. Most likely, they're not gonna progress to further spondylolisthesis, back pain, and instability. How can you tell that? They don't have mechanical back pain. Flexion extension films don't show any significant motion. The facet joints are not splayed, and 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 so forth. So you gotta look at the imaging studies. You gotta put it all together, and then if you if you marry that with the right surgical technique, you can avoid instability and you do a tubular decompression and these patients do really well. And that was done in this case, a tubular decompression and, uh, uh, and we've treated hundreds of patients now like that. I had one of the fellows write this up. He, uh, he summarized the literature of, uh, on patients in, uh, with a lumbar spinal stenosis and spondylolisthesis. And he looked at uh, papers that described open decompression versus minimal invasive decompression. And the verdict here is very clear. If you do an open traditional laminectomy, almost 13% of those patients will come back at some point and they'll need a fusion versus only 3.3% of patients who have a minimal invasive decompression. And patients, patients are also happier when they have a less invasive operation, as you can imagine. Now, so we talked about contralateral decompression and how that minimizes instability. How do you do that procedure? And you should go... Uh, uh, to a cadaver lab. So you can do surgical simulation nowadays. Uh, I know in Bogota, you have a wonderful uh, spine lab where you can also pick up on these techniques and you've got surgeons who can show you how to do that. It's a very, very straightforward operation. If, if you have somebody who shows that to you and teaches you, uh, we use bayoneted instruments, different uh, rangers, obviously. These are just some drawings that walk you through the step-by-step step procedure. So that's a patient with L4, L5 lumbar spinal stenosis. Now this operation we call ULBD, which stands for unilateral laminotomy for bilateral decompression. We, for a right-handed surgeon, we will typically choose a right-sided approach. I use an 18 or 19 millimeter tubular retractor for these operations. I use a 15 or 14 millimeter tube for a discectomy and a 21 or 22 millimeter tube for an MIST lift. But for this particular operation, I use an 18 millimeter tubular retractor. You place the tubular retractor, as you can see here, and then you wanna look for your landmarks. Uh, and that can be confusing if you've never done this or you don't have a lot of experience. You wanna have the inferior edge of the L4 lamina in the central portion of your field. And you, you wanna see the intersection between uh, the, the, uh, the spinous process, the base of the spinous process and the lam lamina and this exactly, this is the point where you start drilling. And um, you start drilling, and then you drill cranially towards your right in this case, and you drill until you expose the insertion of the ligament and flavum. Typically, you will see uh, epidural fat here, and then you lift up the ligament and flavum, 
At that point, I like removing it. Some surgeons leave the ligament to flave them intact uh, in order to protect the dura. Uh, regardless of what you prefer, uh, uh, at some point, however, you want to do the contralateral decompression. And that's where most surgeons have problems. And again, it really helps watching videos, going somewhere, uh, see someone do it. It's really not as hard as, as, as a lot of surgeons, especially fellows and re residents think it is, but it's tricky and obviously you want to avoid complications. Uh, the key is really to rotate the bed, uh, to, to rotate the bed away from you, and then to get access to undercut the spinous process and undercut the contralateral ligament while protecting the dura. And you protect the dura by leaving the contralateral ligament and flavum intact. I drill with one hand and with the other hand I hold the suction, and you can drill a trough behind the ligament on the contralateral side, and that trough. Uh, will then protect your drill bit and protect the dura. Uh, we call this over the top uh, decompression. There's even a movie that was made about that. So, um, and then once you complete your decompression, you can see that you get a beautiful decompression of the contralateral exiting nerve root, the contralateral traversing nerve root, the ipsilateral traversing nerve root, but the nerve root that you can't really decompress is the ipsilateral exiting nerve root. So you got to look at the patient and you got to look at the MRI scan beforehand. You got to make sure that you plan your surgery accordingly, uh, knowing that the ipsilateral ip exiting nerve root is very difficult to decompress. So in that case, you got to uh, choose a different uh, surgical approach if that's the goal. Now I'll show you a few videos. Now this is exactly from the right side at L45. We're looking over the top. We're looking at the dura here. That's the contralateral ligament and flavum. The ipsilateral ligament has been removed and now we're getting ready to go contralateral over the top. So what I do with the ball tip, I have the suction in my left hand with the ball tip. I separate the dura from the ligament and flavum. And, uh, and that's now, and then the tricky part of this operation where a lot of the residents and fellows get nervous is uh, when you have to go contralateral and you start drilling. And how do you do that in, through a small tube uh, without risking a spinal uh, a CSF leak or a nerve root injury? Well, you do that by uh, keeping your suction in your left hand and protecting the dura with your suction. And by drilling away from the dura, lateral to the ligamentum flavum, drilling into the bone, leaving the ligamentum flavum here intact, that creates a lip of ligamentum flavum. You, you drill a trough. And then the drill bit, after, once you have that trough, the drill is totally protected from the dura. And uh, you, can drill the, you can drill all the way down into the lateral recess. And then uh, once you've accomplished that, uh, you will remove the ligament and flavum with the kerosene rongeurs and get the contralateral decompression. And that's now here after removal of the ligament and flavum, you can see we got a beautiful contralateral decompression. Now I'm going back ipsilateral to complete the decompression ipsilateral. So that's how you do the contralateral over the top decompression. The key is really to you know, move the table away, rotate the table away and uh, angle the tube. Now you can do this in the cervical spine as well. We do this uh, now routinely for one or two, sometimes even three level cases where uh, the, the lordosis is still somewhat uh, maintained and patients have severe ligamentous hypertrophy like on this uh, image here that you can remove with a tubular retractor as well. And we just wrote that up for operative neurosurgery with a video. We use navigation for those cases and I also use intraoperative monitoring because it is such a high, uh, it's obviously a high risk area. You wanna make sure that you're not pushing on the dura, that you're really careful. And the navigation is really nice because it helps you orient yourself, especially if, you, if you're more at the beginning of your learning curve. So, I've shown you now the advantages of doing a decompression without, without fusion surgery, if you can do it with over the top surgery. And where do we use that? We, do, we use this again in patients with stable spondylolisthesis and lumbar stenosis, we do a decompression without fusion. If patients have an intraforaminal soft disc herniation, we can frequently go from the contralateral side over the top and remove the soft disc herniation in the foramen. Alternatively, you know, if you're comfortable with the endoscope, you can do an ipsilateral approach with the endoscope sometimes. In patients who have, who require two level surgery, let's say somebody has L4, L5 lumbar stenosis, spondylolisthesis, 
that is unstable. And then they have severe stenosis at the level above or below. We'll do a one level MIS T lift or X lift at the unstable level, and then just drop a tube and do a one level decompression at the adjacent level. We call that one and a half surgery. And then finally, most synovial cysts will, will treat without effusion with an over the top contralateral decompression. So in my practice, I translate MIS, not only in minimal invasive spine surgery, but also minimal and measured instrumentation surgery. And I can tell you, if you're the one surgeon in your neighborhood who can offer patients surgery without fusion, they will, they, they will like that and they will seek you out. What about multi-level lumbar stenosis? Now patients have, you know, as you know, frequently three or four level lumbar spinal stenosis. Uh, Michael Meyer from Munich, uh, who just retired, he, uh, he wrote this up a few years ago. We use a slalom technique. Instead of making one long incision and just going in from one side, we alternate the sides of the approach uh, to minimize the amount of uh, a bone that we drill on one side. Theoretically, that could also maintain stability. Uh, and uh, and uh, we've also written that up in, in, our, in my practice, in our practice. Now, I've had many fellows over the years and, and everybody always asks the same questions. Uh, you know, Rick Fessler and, and Kevin Foley and others, they did a great job introducing a lot of this, but nobody really wrote things down and really made it accessible for trainees. So we, uh, so we kind of uh, decided to write this up and uh, some of the fellows here wrote up this paper a few years ago. We talk about how to use the drill through a tube, what type of tubes to use, what size of tubes, how medial, how lateral do you go, how to treat synovial cysts, how to fix CSF leaks, it's all written up in this paper. And then uh, we came up with some pearls. Uh, surgeons will always ask, you know, do you go from the right side? Do you go from the left side? When do you go contralateral? Uh, you know, and, and there are certain tips and tricks. I don't want to go into all this. Maybe we'll talk about this at the discussion, but it becomes like a science and every level almost is, pre is being treated differently depending on the uh, pathology. A few important uh, general uh, uh, tricks though that I use in my practice, as I mentioned before, I will always, once, once I drop the tubular retractor, I will always, regardless of whether I do a microdiscectomy, an MIS T lift, or uh, an MIS laminectomy, I will always start drilling at the exactly the same point, namely at the junction, the base of the spinous process and the lamina. You start drilling here, you, the first thing you look for is ligamentum flavum. Once you see ligamentum flavum exposed, you, you know where you are, you know how medial lateral you are, and uh, we take it from there. And then if you do a microdiscectomy, you go lateral, right? Because that's where the disc is. If you do an over-the-top decompression for lumbar spinal stenosis, you go cranial because you're looking for the insertion of the ligamentum flavum. And if you do an MIS T lift, you go 45 degrees because you want to disarticulate the inferior articulating process of the facet joint because you want to harvest that bone for your fusion, okay? So think about it logically and always try to do the same thing. The key to being, being able to drill under the microscope and through a tube is to hold the drill like a pencil and then to stabilize the drill in every instrument really that you use, always uh, stabilize it against the rim of the tube and try maybe also even put a finger on this patient's skin. So you've got three point fixation that's how you can drill with one hand and then you have the other hand for your suction. So those are little tips and tricks that really are difficult to communicate in, in a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, you should really consider maybe um, going to one of the courses and, and picking it up there. Finally, I wanna to talk to you about the, the third MIS technique principle. And that is really the idea of indirect decompression by putting in cages to the side. Um, the uh, most, um, uh, um, I think a popular approach is obviously the lateral approach. Uh, you can do it obliquely as well, uh, but the idea is always the same. You come in from the side, you remove the disc, you put in a cage and you get indirect decompression. And the idea is again, you, you put in the cage, you get indirect stretching of ligament and flavum. You can treat lumbar spinal stenosis. In patients with uh, degenerative uh, scoliosis, uh, who present without back pain, but maybe just radicular pain because they have uh, severe foraminal stenosis on one side, 
you could do if you identify, and that goes back to the target principle, if you identify those patients accurately and you can tell them you've got an L3 radiculopathy because uh, the L3, L4 disc is collapsed, you've got severe foraminal narrowing, you can do a targeted minimal invasive lateral approach for an L3, L4 discectomy fusion and avoid like a huge uh, scoliosis correction operation. And these patients are exceedingly happy because they go home the next day and uh, their pain is gone. And that works again with indirect decompression. You put in the cage, you decompress that nerve root. This is a case that we did a number of years ago. Uh, this is a right-sided L3 nerve compression because of degenerative scoliosis. You can see how tight, how severely compressed that nerve is. Uh, for that, by the way, I always look at the parasagittal images for foramal stenosis on the T1 weighted images are usually better than the T2 weighted images. Uh, the nerve on the other side was completely open, as you can see on the left side. So we did a just a simple lateral approach for cage placement. And uh, this is 15 months later. You can see that that uh, this after the um, uh, fusion here, 15 months later, beautiful decompression of that nerve root. And she was a very, very happy lady. At that time point, I still used lateral plates. I don't use lateral plates anymore biomechanically. They're not as stable and there's a a certain risk of, of the people, you know, body fractures. So I will always put in pedicles. I don't, I don't use standalone anymore. Uh, I, I would always put single stage. In this case, I would do a single stage instrumentation with probably bilateral pedicle screws today. And again, you can do that single stage. You put the lateral cage, and then at the same time with navigation or fluoroscopy, you can put in your pedicle screws. Now, the key with indirect decompression is when does it work and when does it not work? So we did a whole series of publications over the years trying to figure out how can you predict beforehand whether or not indirect decompression is going to work in these patients. So we looked at our own patients <clears throat> and, and we also did a, a, re, a, a, a analysis of the literature. But, you know, and, and there are certain factors that you could consider maybe relevant, you know, the size of the cage, the height of the cage, the side of the approach, you know, if you talk to the companies, they'll always tell you, oh, if you put the cage all the way in the front, you're going to get more low doses. If you put it more in the back, you get more foraminal decompression. Well, we wanted to find out, is that really true? And we looked at our own patients and we also reviewed the literature and we found that cage height, the type of the cage, if it's a parallel or slightly lodotic cage, the positioning and, and the side of the approach didn't make any difference in terms of radiographic outcome and indirect decompression. So what we found though, was that what made a difference was the, the, the width of the cage. So if you use, and these cages, as you know, they come 18 millimeter, 20, 22 millimeters, 26 millimeters. So what we found that it did not really matter how tall the cage is, but the width of the cage was much more important because that determines the subsidence. So if you, if you insert a cage that's wider, you will prevent subsidence and that ultimately is gonna be a success for your indirect decompression. Um, and that, may, that makes a huge difference now because I, I, I know in the beginning, I would try to always put in like a 12, 14 millimeter cage. And when you do that, you, you always get end plate injuries and, and then you get complications. So this study showed us that you didn't have to do that. You, you can put in an eight millimeter cage, as long as that cage is 22 or 26 millimeters wide, you're gonna get really nice indirect decompression and also deformity correction, or at least coronal deform deformity correction. Uh, so that in terms of procedure factors, the cage width is really the most important thing. In terms of patient factors, when, when does indirect decompression not work? Um, we and others also found that lateral, severe lateral recess stenosis, especially from a hypertrophied facet joint, causes nerve compression of the traversing nerve root that is not successfully treated just by putting in a cage. Uh, you can treat central stenosis successfully, you can treat uh, more foraminal stenosis successfully, but if that patient is really symptomatic from compression of the traversing nerve root, due to a severe lateral recess stenosis situation, a lateral approach is not gonna be very successful. So you gotta take that into consideration and maybe consider if you have to do a lateral approach, maybe consider at the same time a direct decompression as well. And we do that now all the time 
uh, in patients who have that type of pathology. So lateral recess stenosis, you gotta figure that out before surgery and cage width is very important. Now, uh, what about deformity correction? Obviously, the other thing is that now with the new technologies, you've got these hyperlordotic cages. You, you can perform ALL releases. Again, something that you should try in the, in the cadaver a few times, obviously, and, and maybe train with somebody who is experienced. But if you do that, you can get really nice deformity correction. Initially, with lateral surgeries, the, the amount of deformity correction in terms of lordosis was very, very minimal. But now with these hyperlordotic cages and... Uh, and uh, uh, you know surgical uh, techniques such as ALL release and so forth, you can get really nice deformity correction. And that is reflected in some of the publications. This is one of my partners, Kai Fu, uh, published that with, uh, together with uh, Praveen, Mumunemi and others as an algorithm for how you use MIS to treat certain types of deformities. And you can, you know, the mild and moderate and even more severe deformities now, class one, class two, class three, you can treat very successfully with a combination of different types of MIS procedures, you know, ALL release, ALL release, ACR, mini open PSOs, expandable cages, and so forth. All these things together allow you to expand the indication of MIS surgery into the deformity world. However, when it gets to really a multi-level procedures and severe deformities, you still have to rely on open, open surgery. Uh, this is a, um, a case uh, who, uh, uh, yeah, this is just an example, a case that we did with a moderate, mild to moderate uh, deformities, uh, degenerative scoliosis, a 70 year old woman with severe back pain and left, left leg pain from, uh, from uh, the fractional curve here where she had severe compression of the uh, exiting of five nerve root. Uh, so there's a mild to moderate deformity, but this is a great case for MIS surgery. We did a three level lateral approach, and then MIS T live at L5 is one. And uh, she did really well. She went home two days after surgery and uh, was walking the day after surgery. So those are really gratifying operations because with open surgery, this would have turned into a huge operation. Uh, this is another case as a patient who had a previous surgery done at a different institution and now developed adjacent segment disease at L5 as one and at L3, L4. And, uh, uh, you can see here, uh, you've got that vacuum disc phenomenon at the level above, below, a good fusion at L4-5. Uh, this was a great case for a lateral or single stage operation where, where we did a lateral A-lift here. So we get nice indirect decompression, some deformity correction, and a lateral approach here at L3-4 for cage placement. And then MIS percutaneous the screws from the back, remove the old screws, put in new screws, and did everything single stage. So this is the A-lift approach here. And then we did another incision for the lateral surgery there. That's the, that's the vascular surgeon here closing up. And we start putting in screws from the back with navigation. The reference array is attached to the iliac crest. And uh, we use the, uh, the intraoperative CT scanner, the arrow here. Uh, and uh, that works really nicely. This is just the, uh, some, some shots from putting in the, the screws here with navigation. We gotta really make sure that that patient is fixed in place and there's no motion. There are certain ways of doing that. That's a different talk, uh, but navigation obviously works really nicely in these cases. And that's the post-operative X-ray. This patient did really well. Now uh, I have a few more, actually I have one more minute, but uh, I just wanna show you teaching and training. So how do we teach and train all this? Obviously cadaver labs are great. And uh, if you can learn it in your hospital, uh, but, there are, but there are certain simulation technologies now available, especially this particular uh, technology here, which simulates uh, the spinal pathology in the lumbar spine with uh, almost real bone. Uh, so the haptic characteristics are really great. You can use your, your the regular surgical instruments that you use in the operating room. That's, you, know, you can, this is plastic, but you drill the bone, it feels like real bone. It has dura, it has, a ligamentum flavum. And this is a model that allows you to over and over train and teach uh, these techniques that we talked about, especially using the drill, using the microscope. So if you have an opportunity to go to courses where they offer this type of training, or sometimes now we do with AO and with other organizations, 
We can even come to your hospital and bring these models and spend a day or two days there. And you can use this in the operating room uh, with exactly the instruments that you would usually use for the surgery and really get some expertise and get some training uh, with uh, lumbar stenosis, over the top uh, decompression, MIST lift and so forth. So, uh, uh, so we, we did this uh, and I'm not gonna go into this here, but I, I, wanna, uh, I wanna talk at the end, just uh, a few more slides about the curriculum. You know, all the work that we've done all these years in MIS, uh, we put together a group within AO Spine and MIS Task Force. So we had eight surgeons from all over the world. Uh, you know, I'm sure you know a lot of those from South America, Nestor, obviously, and then a bunch of other surgeons, Richard Asaka from France, Mohamed Asus from Jordan, uh, Christoph Hofstetter from Seattle, Paul Taylor from Australia, Avelino from Spain, Luke Kim, uh, from South Korea, all experts in their particular field, a mixture of neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons. And we developed over the course of two years, multiple meetings, a lot of work. We uh, developed uh, educational material that covers uh, the curriculum in terms of how to use a microscope, how to use the endoscope, how to fix a drill tear, how to achieve bleeding control through a tubular retractor, for example, navigation, radiation reduction. And then we also covered four tubular procedures step-by-step, step, three endoscopic procedures, and two instrumentation procedures, percutaneous pedicle screws and MIST lift. And we've got PowerPoint presentations, PDFs, videos, uh, uh, and, and, and that's all available. Currently, it is limited to AO spine, so you would have to sign up for an AO spine course, and then you get... Um, you get exposure to that material and, uh, and hopefully go to a course. But we're trying to partner with other organizations such as NAS, ESMIS and so forth. So this material and an expansion of that material which we're working on will be available for teaching and training really worldwide. But if you go to AO, uh, uh, we're already doing MIS courses all over the place uh, using this material. A lot of this now is flipped classroom. So you have access to this material before the course you work through it yourself. And then at the course, you really just talk to the expert, do practical exercises and kind of do deep dive into those procedures. So the learning experience becomes much more uh, relevant. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, endoscopic uh, videos, but also microscopic videos, it's all uh, available. And then the apps also, uh, right now, as I mentioned, it's, it's kind of, so some material is available uh, freely or you can just go to the AO website for some of the material you have to sign up and maybe go to a course. Now at the end of my presentation uh, I just want to briefly summarize so I talked to you about the five T's of becoming a successful minimum invasive spine surgeon. I still believe that the most important thing is the number one T is target is patient selection okay and I think I really think we should do a whole day course at one point, just talking about this. Nobody's ever done that, but we should really do that because patient selection is everything. Tools, technology, we talked about a little bit, but there are many, many courses, books, papers that go into that, YouTube videos, techniques are relevant. I would strongly encourage you to go to uh, courses where you can hone your techniques or visit a surgeon. We have a lot of people come to New York, visit some of the other members of the MIS task force or other surgeons who have a name in minimal invasive surgery, watch them, uh, attend courses, uh, cadaver courses, simulation courses, and so forth. Teaching and training is important for yourself, but also for your trainees, of course. At some point, you always wanna collect your own data. You wanna know, you're gonna do research on your own results. My last 100 T-lift cases, you know, did they go well? How do patients do? That's gonna make you a better surgeon. So at the end of the day, I think that MIS is, is relevant for about 75% of what we do in spine. Uh, the goal is to uh, save resources, make intelligent decisions. Don't fuse everybody. Try to use your surgical techniques to avoid fusion surgery. Uh, at the same time, knowing though, by, by knowing how to do MIS, you will expand your indications and you will be suddenly able to treat other patients who previously were not surgical candidates because you know how to do a minimal invasive 
XLIF operation in an 85 year old and they're gonna do really, really well. That wasn't possible 10 or 15 years ago. So um, that's it. I think pretty much at the end, if you ever wanna to come to New York, I think we'll do our course again this December. Hopefully it's gonna be a real life course, hands-on. If not, we'll do something similar, uh, but that course in New York is very successful and we give you the whole exposure to navigation, augmented reality, virtual reality, endoscopy and so forth. So thank you so much again for the invitation and uh, I'm happy to take your questions if there, if there are any questions. Okay, thank you, Roger. This has been a very, very informative uh, talk. Uh, thank you greatly for this information and all your experience. Uh, now we're gonna address some questions from the audience. So uh, Mary James Gadi asks, what is your experience with endoscopic MIS surgery? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a good question. I, uh... I, uh, I, I personally, I don't do a lot of uh, endoscopic uh, uh, surgery, not, not because I don't believe in it, but because I, I think that uh, you really got to pick up on those techniques early on in your learning curve. I mean, we talked about this a little bit before we got started here today. Uh, uh, I think endoscopic surgery has certain advantages. Uh, it's really, if you look at the range of, if you look at the graph that I showed in the beginning, it's really more the more simple pathology right now. It's the uh, discectomies. It allows you to do, for example, transferamal approaches, very elegant approaches for revision cases, uh, you know, approaches that would be very difficult to do with open surgery. Uh, we're expanding a little bit into fusion surgery, like MIS T lift with uh, endoscopic techniques. I think if I was, uh, I mean, not that I'm, you know, older, older, but if I was like, 15 years younger, I would, I would definitely look very, very closely at endoscopic surgery, but, but you gotta, you gotta, you gotta have time. You gotta do a lot of these cases. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I have one of my partners who does endoscopic surgery and he does it very well. And I encourage him to push his limits more and more. Um, so I, I, I certainly think there's value to it. And then there are obviously individuals such as Luke Kim from South Korea, Christoph Hofstetter, and others, many others who are really pushing the envelope. And I'm really excited to kind of see where that goes in five or 10 years from now. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Madrinyan asks, uh, what is your opinion of interspinous spacers? Yeah, you know, it's like one of those things that uh, it's a great idea originally, uh, but it just has not proven to be that effective. I mean, there may be a few indications here and there uh, but uh, I, I, I used to, you know, and I think I, I, I kind of reflect a lot of other surgeons when I say that, that the indications are not as generous as, as sometimes they were advertised. Um, so I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think they're very, in my personal, I, I don't believe in, in that. I think it's, it's a very, very narrow indication list. Maybe, maybe in patients where you can do it, patients who, can have general anesthesia, uh, you want to do it open, get a little bit of a decompression. Patients who are just not really surgical candidates for a tubular or endoscopic decompression for whatever reason. And there are very, very few patients that are not really candidates for that. All right, thank you. Um, another question is that, uh, what has been your experience with bicortical, or with cortical pedicle screws, the mid liver approach? Yeah, again, you know, I, I, I let some of the other partners in my group get into that. I, I was never too excited about it because, you know, I, I do a lot of T-lip surgery and I use navigation and in my hands, that, that's a great operation. I never saw the need to really uh, expand that. And, and time has shown that, you know, the surgeons, surgeons used it for a while. I, I, now I, I don't know any surgeon who still does that, you know, I think people had had some problems with uh, screw placement, uh, fusion rates, and there was just not really, the, the, you know, the, the, there's no real killer. It's not a killer application for anything. It's, it's, it's no huge benefit really, you know. What was, a, what was the real uh, revolution was like the, the lateral approach. You know, that was a huge revolution. 
it took off like nothing else. But that minor modification from MIST lift to the cortical screws, as interesting as it seems and sounds, doesn't seem to really uh, have that big of a different benefit, you know? Yes. Um, uh, with, with respect to um, one of the indications that are used for cortical screws, there's a question, do you have a, any screening protocol and any special considerations for patients with uh, high-grade osteoporosis? Yeah, of course. I mean, we will very routinely now get uh, bones, uh, you know, bone densities in patients, especially older women, a lot of women uh, with degenerative scoliosis, spondylolisthesis. And, you know, I mean, most of these cases are not emergency cases, right? You have time. So I, I, will, I will treat them with... Uh, uh, with uh, 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 you know medication to increase the bone density for three to four months, if I have time, or at least I will get them started. You know with parathyroid analog medication, so for tear or tim loss here, and at least get them started for four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, and then do the surgery, and then treat them throughout the process for six months or four years. Again, uh, I do that because these operations are not emergency surgeries. You know, it's, it's, you do this for pain primarily. If there is a neurological deficit or if it's, if it's more urgent, I'll still do the operation, but I may use bone cement for the screws and I may still start them on the medication, just not treat them for that long before. And a question, a follow-up question. Uh, do you have uh, any specific T-score uh, upon which you definitely do not operate on. No, there's no, there's no particular number. I mean, I, I take into, you know, I look at the, I, I look at the CT scan, I look at the scores, and uh, I look at the overall indication for the surgery. But I have a, I have a low threshold to postpone the surgery if, if I get the impression that the risks of the surgery outweigh the benefits at this point. But okay. there's no, there's no absolute number. I mean. The cut of what is it, 2.8 minus 2.8, 2. Point, I mean, I kind of look at the ballpark number and then I try to make a rational decision, but there's not like one number that I use as an absolute, you know, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, with respect to fusion, uh, uh, there's a question. What is your preferred choice for bone graft material? Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, we looked at that. We, uh, we looked at MIST lift surgeries a lot, you know, because we, we published a paper on MIST lip and uh, uh, showing that the fusion rate was very, was because initially surgeons would always say, oh, MIST lip, the fusion rates are very low. Then we published a paper that showed that the fusion rate was as high or maybe higher than open, MI, than open T lip surgery. But in that paper, we saw that in those studies, 50% of the cases were done with BMP and, and the MIST lip cases. And, and that was just not really, uh, acceptable because uh, BMP is important. There are side effects, there are risks associated with it. And you can't really turn MIST lip into a successful operation if you have to say, well, but you know, you can use, you can do MIST lip, but you, but you got to use BMP. So we did a follow up study where we looked at all the cases that were done MIST lip and we, and we tried to correlate the bone graft material with fusion rates. And if you do that, it turns out that. Yes, the, with BMP, the fusion rates are a little bit higher, like 98, 99%, the fusion rates, the reported fusion rates in the literature, okay? If you, if you, if you use autograph bone uh, with plus minus expanders, such as calcium phosphate or so, the, the fusion rate is in the 93, 94% grade. And I thought, I thought that was very reassuring. Uh, you know, a 94% is very high. In my opinion, and and I and I felt that the difference between that and the ninety nine percent didn't really justify the BMP. So in my practice, I, I will I will always use auto, as much autograph bone as possible. That's why I harvest the facet joint and I grind it up, and I mix it with with if if, if necessary I, I I mix it with DBX or DBM or whatever bone graft material is available, or 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 I don't mix it at all. I just use auto autograph. So, so I think autograft is the, is the, if you put everything together, the pros and cons, the risks, autograft alone is the best choice. 
and okay. surgical and, and the other thing is surgical technique. You really gotta you gotta spend you know 20, 25 minutes uh, just doing a thorough discectomy. You know, you gotta really spend the time cleaning the end plates. Uh, and, uh, and and that's that's the most important thing, you know, and then and then put the autograph bone in there and then the cage or together with the cage or afterwards. But but the surgical technique, the disc preparation is, is really important. Thank you, Roger. Uh, another question. What has your experience been with on the axial lift procedure versus the a lift procedure? The axial lift. Oh, my God. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, we just uh, we just wrote up. I mean, we just wrote it up. Now, the axial lift was one of my biggest uh, mistakes as a as a as my initial. It was like the typical mistake that somebody makes who was eager to get involved in MI surgery, and then you take up a technology that's not proven, that was poorly studied, and that was really. Uh, in terms of the approval, it was approved based on a predicate that was totally different from the axial lift. So um, uh, I, I did about 35, 40 cases, and it, it be, you know we, we saw a lot of non-unions early on, and uh, we had to remove the screws. So uh, so it was uh, so I don't obviously I don't use it anymore. I, I think it may still be available, but but I don't know any serious spine surgeon who still uses it, and it just totally fell out of favor. But it, it's again, it, the problem was here that it was more wishful thinking on the surgeon's side than really looking at the data and the science. It was a poorly studied procedure and we, we adopted it way too early. And that's my biggest concern with all new technologies that come out that you just kind of, you want this to work. You, you're, you're a young surgeon, you wanna adopt something, you wanna be known for, for, for that type of procedure and then you start doing it but you don't look at the data and you don't really think about, you know, what has been shown, what hasn't been shown. Is this really safe? You know, is this really going to do what it's supposed to do? And uh, with Axial Lift, as, as attractive as it sounded, it was it just didn't work. I so guess a that's one. Sorry. So a I'm sorry. So Let's continue. A, a Lift on the other side, A Lift is, a, is, is one of the best operations in spine surgery. I guess that would be one of the uh, disadvantages of being on the spear point of innovation, I guess. Sometimes you're gonna yeah. have to miss. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you gotta be really critical, but with Axial Lift, I mean, we just looked at the whole, we, we, uh, we wrote up a paper describing, you know, in retrospect, you wonder what, you know, well, how did we get into this? You know, why did nobody say anything earlier? It was conflict of interest among some of the authors who wrote up the early experience. It was wishful thinking, not critical thinking. And uh, one, one should have had much more data initially uh, before really approving that procedure for that purpose. That was, that was the problem. Thank you. I have another question is uh, what considerations you have on the o lift versus the x lift or anti -SOS and trans -SOS approaches? Yeah, you know, I, you know there, there are a lot of heated debates out there, you know, which one is better. I think as a spine surgeon, or MI spine surgeon, you got to be able to do one of those. You know, you got to be good at one of those. I think that uh, you pick, you pick O lift, you pick uh, X lift, uh, and um, and you, you know, I think they do for the most part. They're very, very similar. They have a dis different spectrum of complications. And, uh, you know, one has more vascular injury complications. The other one has more neurological complications. Uh, but in terms of the indications, in terms of the outcomes, at the end of the day, they're very, very similar. And I think you just got to choose. And, and, and then which one you're going to pick, that depends on who you train with, where you train, what, what equipment you have access to, um, uh, your personal preference. Uh, I think, uh, but but I think you should be able to do one of those really well because you need that if you really want to be able to treat the pathologies. I think you got to be able to do an over-the-top decompression. You got to be able to do a good MIST lift. You got to be able to do a good lateral surgery. Uh, those are the three key procedures if you want to be a good MIS surgeon. Uh, and uh, uh, but only for I, I don't have a preference. I mean, I do X lift because I was trained in X lift. And uh, you know, I, in my opinion, it's a great operation. 
But again, if I was, uh, you know, a few years younger, maybe I would uh, be looking more into all it. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. What is your opinion for unilateral pedicle screws for T-Lift? Yeah, I've done that too. I've done that mistake as well. So, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so yeah, again, it's, it's wishful thinking. It's like the whole thing with interspinous spaces and axial lift. You, you want this to work, you know, because it sounds so minimal invasive, it sounds so great, but biology is against you, okay? Um, unilateral pedicle screws, at least with the technology that we have right now, or maybe we had five, 10 years ago, it, it just, the data doesn't support the fusion rates, you know, the, it's just not that successful. And, um, and uh, maybe, maybe with better cage technology, maybe if you spent, really long time with it. The key is obviously you want to get the fusion. So if you get maybe better cage materials, cage technology, maybe you can over, overcome the downside of one-sided pedicle screws and, the, and, and, and you can eliminate the need for the contralateral pedicle screws. But, but right now I, I would not uh, make that my career choice. I think the data just doesn't support it. Uh, with reference to uh, cage technologies, uh, there's a question. Uh, what is your experience and your, your considerations for choosing expandable versus non-expandable cages for interbody spacers? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very lucky because I have access to expandable cages, okay? I think it's a great technology. I think it's advanced uh, a lot. I think, you know, I, I believe in, in titanium as a material for cages that is very advantageous uh, for spinal surgery. Uh, I like the uh, expand the expandable cages, and uh, it allows you to you know if you do for example an MIST lift if you have an expandable cage available, uh, it it, uh, it you don't have to ex you, you don't have to distract off the screws for for example, which eliminates a very painful step that we used to do you know to expand off the screws you have to put in these expanders and and it's, it's complicated. So now with expandable cages, you, you don't have to do that. You just put in the expandable cage and then you expand the cage and you get that uh, really nice purchase in the disk space. So, and, and then there, there's a lot of technology coming up. I think that's gonna be really exciting. You know, uh, lodotic uh, cages that it's become more lodotic, that widen, they become lodotic and the, and the footprint widens at the same time. I think that's gonna be really exciting. So I thank think, you. yes, animal cages are really good. All right, thank you. Uh, with respect to surgical technique in reintervention surgery, uh, a question arose, uh, how do you remove or what considerations do you, who, do you have about removing old rods that in MIS cases? Uh, for revision? Sir? Yes. So <laughs> patients that has, have been previously operated on on an MIS technique that need a revision, revision surgery and you have to remove the rod? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's certain things. I mean, you like like the case I showed the same, I, I showed at the end, I showed a, cage, a case that we did single stage lateral and that patient had an L45 fusion with L45 pedicle screws and, and, rod, and, and rods. So a lot of these revision situations now in a lot of these revision situations, we'll, we'll use a lift or lateral surgery, okay? So that patient is going to be in a lateral position and you can, you can it's, it's relatively straightforward even from a lateral position to get to the rods and, and remove the rods. And sometimes you, you have to make a separate incision just, and, and you, you don't use the old incision. You make a parallel incision. You get down to the screws, to the rods and you remove the rods and navigation Navigation can be very helpful to find that perfect incision to get down to the rod. So um, that's that's kind of what comes to mind when I think about these types of revision cases. Uh, you don't have to open up the old incision. You can make a separate incision, you use navigation for planning, and then you use that same, if you extend the fusion higher up, then you just use that, make that new incision longer and put in your screws above and below and put in longer rods. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I have another question. Um, uh, you have various uh, attendees. Uh, yes, thank you for a great talk. 
uh, there's a question, another question with respect to cages, in particular, um, parotic, uh, you know, the parotic titanium cages. Uh, what is your opinion on those cages versus traditional peak cages? Yeah, you know, I, uh, I, I like, I like the, uh, the titanium cages and I like the porous technology. I like the 3D printed technology. Uh, there are some studies that indicate that those cages show really good fusion rates. I, I, and I've, I've completely switched from, from, from peak to titanium. Uh, it's, it's really personal preference and it's, uh, upon reviewing the literature, I think that the results are really promising. And, uh, and that's really my opinion. I, I, I try to avoid peak now as much as possible in the cervical spine as well. I, you know, uh, in, in Europe, they do multi-level ACDFs with porous titanium cages and they don't use any plates and they get really good fusion rates. I was, very, I was always very impressed by that because as you know, in North America, we always use plates and screws. So I think there's something to those porous titanium cages that uh, really, um, uh, really uh, facilitates fusion, you know, the biology of those cages. Thank you. Uh, we have another question with respect to uh, cervical surgery. Uh, what appreciation do you have for MIS techniques in the upper cervical levels or upper cervical spine? Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, there, there are two frontiers for MIS. One is complex deformity surgery and the other one is cervical surgery in general. Now, if you, if you think about the anterior cervical approaches, I mean, those are relatively minimal invasive already, you know, like ACDFs, two, three, even four level ACDFs. Posterior cervical, especially at C1, C2, to do that MIS, other than a decompression, I mean, we do tubular decompressions up there if, 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 if that's the pathology that we need to treat. But the instrumentation and, uh, of, of C1 and C2, do, to do that really minimal invasive, is, is, is tricky because uh, you need navigation and, and that area is not very uh, conducive for navigation because the muscle is very, very tight. If you put in your instruments, uh, the muscle will sometimes read and the fascia will redirect your instrument and you can't pick that up on navigation necessarily. So I'm very, very hesitant to really uh, endorse MIS, uh, especially MIS instrumented fusions for the upper uh, uh, cervical spine or for cervical pedicle screws in general. I think it's, uh, it's, it, it, I think it may not be worth, the, the risks may, may not be worth uh, potential benefit. But I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's something that we need to work on more. You know, there, there are some groups, uh, uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Richter in, in, in Germany who does great work with uh, MIS for cervical instrumentation but he uses multiple incisions, you know, he uses navigation and he goes in, he does multiple incisions, the midline for the decompression and then lateral incisions for the, for the pedicle screws. And I think it's very interesting. I'm just not really sure that it's really that much of a benefit. We have another question. It's a two tiered question They're not very related one to each other, but um, is this following. Um, first is, uh, what is your recommendation or the role of MIS with respect to high grade spondylolisthesis and if bicortical pedicle screws are of any use in this case? And the second question uh, is mm -hmm. if uh, you have any preference or any recommendation with respect to bone graft in tuberculosis spondylitis. Right. Well, high-grade spondylolisthesis, uh, I think when you get to the point where it's like a grade three or grade four, I think that's not really a good area for MIS. You know, that, that really falls, in my opinion, falls outside the benefit zone. If you recall, the benefit zone of MIS is really the tubular decompression, MIS T-lift, three, four, five level MIS fusions, but then significant deformity and high-grade spondy falls into that area of significant deformity MIS is not a great uh, is not a great option. Uh, maybe maybe uh, maybe a partial MIS if you want to put in percutaneous screws, maybe. But I think for the in cases where you really have to achieve adequate um, uh, 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 reduction, uh, and then and, and or or more complex instrumentation procedures, 
I, I would not, I think that again, the, the, uh, the, the benefits don't outweigh the risks here, you know. Uh, I do grade two spondies with MIS all the time, you know, and grade two spondies where, uh, in my opinion, the reduction is not necessarily uh, important. You know, if they have overall good saddle balance, uh, then I will definitely do uh, MIS T lift and they've got good bone quality. But grade three or more, I think you're better off doing this open, you know. So also, then in those cases, they have severe nerve compression. You know, if you if the nerves are being tethered. And, uh, and I think you want to have really exposure and you want to control this uh, more, uh, more with open surgery. Thank you, Roger. Uh, there's uh, another question with your, respect to your previous experience with uh, endoscopic surgery is that uh, have, uh, what has been your experience with respect to using or have you used the endoscope uh, with the tubular retractor and uh, what has you, been your experience uh, doing this, if you have. Yeah, you know, I, I, I've, I've never used the endoscope with a tube, but that's what Kevin Foley originally described. You know, when they used the uh, the tubular retractor in the uh, in the in the late '90s, the first papers were published with the tubular retractor and the endoscope going through, and and then Rick Fessler still uses it. You know, but he's the only one I know who does that, and. Uh, 99% of spine surgeons who use tubular retractors, they'll, they'll use the microscope. Uh, there's, uh, there's now a movement uh, towards the exoscope instead of the microscope. And I think that's very, very interesting. I think you could use an exoscope where you put it in the camera and then you have it all on a big screen. The, the challenge with the exoscope is the image quality that it's not as good as a microscope still, no matter what the companies tell you, but it's not as good as a microscope. Well, I, I think it's going to get there, but to the endoscope through the um, uh, through the tube, uh, nobody does that. Now there's a Dupuy Synthes. They're working on a MIST lift uh, procedure that comes with a tube that has a camera uh, at the tip of the tube. You know, and I think that's very very interesting. So it's a little bit like, like a merger between endoscope and microscope. Now, I think we're, we're going to see more more and more of that. But, but really, like the traditional endoscope through the tube, nobody does that anymore. Thank you, Roger. And finally, uh, we have an education-related question. Uh, for novel surgeons, uh, if you could make a scale um, of progressive complexity for uh, most for degenerative MIS approaches, what would be your uh, order from less complex for maybe the beginner and going up to maybe a more mature surgeon's uh, uh, procedure. Right. Well, I think if you, if you wanted to train, I mean, that's, that, that goes back to the curriculum that we put together for, for, uh, for AO Spine, right? <clears throat> and, and we started with basic skills. The basic skills for MIS surgery are how to use a drill, uh, how to use a microscope, how to use fluoroscopy, uh, how to check how, how how to fix the CSF leak. So if you have the ability to train all those things outside a human being, like in a cadaver with surgical simulation, then you should do that. I mean, you should and and that you know how to use a drill, for example. You can you can use bone models. You can you can practice that in in the lab. You've got a beautiful lab in Bogota. Uh, you know you can teach your residents and trainees how to use the drill. Uh, surgical simulation, you know, we've got the real spine models, other models, you can, you can use that. And then, and then, so you can, you can individualize the particular skills and train them separately. And then you put it all together, then obviously the first operation would be probably a tubular discectomy. And then the next operation after that would be a tubular over the top decompression. And the next procedure after that would be a tubular MIS T lift. And then, and then you go, and then maybe a two level or three level, you know, decompression, slalom technique, you know, and then, and then you get into lateral approaches. Then it's going to be how to do an O lift or X lift plus MIS T lift, and then drop your, drop the rods. So it's a stepwise approach, you know, but, but it starts, the beauty now is you, you can really train individual skills without having to go into a patient. You know, you can, you can, you can check the mic, you can, practice in the microscope, you can check, uh, practice the drilling, 
And so once you get into the patient, you already, you already have some skills. Thank you. Uh, another question. Um, when would you consider an lateral lift, be it X lift or O lift, plus percutaneous screws versus a T lift? Yeah, so that's a great question too. So I, I have I, I can I can tell you exactly what my thinking is. It goes back to surgical principles. You got to differentiate direct decompression MIST lift, indirect decompression X lift O lift L lift. Okay, and then it goes back to patient selection. So if you have somebody with L4 5 severe lumbar stenosis, okay, and uh, spondylar disease, let's say. If that patient is clinically symptomatic from the severe lumbar stenosis, and let's say there's uh, facet overgrowth, severe lateral recess stenosis, that tells me that that patient is going to need a direct decompression. So automatically, automatically that means an MIST lift in my hands. If that patient, on the other hand, has no, no lateral recess stenosis and it's purely foraminal stenosis, then I may do a lateral approach uh, because uh, indirect decompression is going to be successful. Now, then obviously it depends on the, the patient's anatomy, you know, so the, the psoas muscle, the iliac crest, and so forth, you know. But let's say at L3-4, you can pretty much always do an X-lift procedure. If there's severe stenosis, I may do uh, MIST lift. If it's not severe, if it's more foraminal stenosis, disc collapse, I'll do an X-lift. So the, the differentiation between direct decompression, indirect decompression. The second thing I look at is low doses. If somebody requires low doses, then I'll, I'm more likely to go from the front or from the side. If the goal of the operation is to, if the low dose is not so important for whatever reason, then I'm more, more likely to do a T-lift because you gotta understand that with an MIS T-lift, you cannot really restore low doses. The best you can hope for is you maintain it, but you cannot really get good low doses correction. Thank you, Roger. Well, thank you. Everything uh, that you have told us has been of great value and very enlightening. Uh, we appreciate uh, all that you have done for this uh, Congress. I remember uh, to all our attendees that tomorrow we will continue with uh, our, our other speakers. Uh, thank you to all the uh, speakers for today that have uh, uh, presented their talks. They have been very, very informative and a very good help, a great help. Uh, right now we have had uh, 120 countries participating with 3,000 uh, subscribed attendees. So uh, it has been a great success and I hope that you can all share uh, this experience with us in the next following days. To you, Roger, I thank you again uh, for this uh, intervention and helping us sharing your knowledge and your experience with us. Thank you so much. And everybody out there, stay safe and healthy, you and your families. And uh, again, it's a great honor to be here. Thank you. Uh, please remember that uh, tomorrow we start again uh, all the talks to, that were done today will be available on Monday on the webpage uh, for those who missed maybe a talk or two. So then uh, you can have the opportunity to uh, get this wonderful knowledge. Uh, thank you very much. Great. Thank you.